How many choices do we make every day? Do you ever get stuck making the same ones over and over again? How do we break the cycle? How do we go from wanting better for ourselves to doing better for ourselves? Sometimes we just need a reset. Good morning, everyone, and we're excited about this new series that we're in because I think all of us from time to time in our life have to evaluate where we are, how we're doing life, and we have to ask ourselves, you know, is this working for us? Like Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? And we have to kind of come away with an assessment, and we have to be honest about it because we're never going to make any real definite changes in life if we're not honest with ourselves about how we are doing life right now. We're responsible for us, and we are uh, large and in charge of the decisions that we make. And in this life that we're living, there comes moments in time where we need to reset. We just need to reevaluate and readjust and restart some things in our life again, because life is going to get convoluted and confusing and difficult enough, and it's going to demand of us from time to time a reset. One of the things we know about the people that come to our churches, as Chima was talking about in a, mo a moment ago, is that we're all broken. There's not a person in this room that isn't going through something or has not gone through something in life that has almost just demanded a reset. To reevaluate life, to relook at life, to be able to say, I can't continue to do things as I've been doing them, and by the grace of God, life is short. I can't live the rest of my life the way the first of my life is gone. I need a reset. And we've been talking about in this series just this idea that God is the God of the reset. He's the God of the do-over. He's the God of the second chance. He's the God of the plan B. So it doesn't matter what plan you're on. You may say, Bill, I'm way past plan B. We're down about G or H, you know. Well, that's fine. Here's what I can tell you about that. Is as long as you're alive, God's not finished with you yet. Can I tell you, you are immortal until God is finished with you. Uh, and, and you say, well, how will I know when he's finished with me? You'll know. <laughs> You'll know the moment he's finished with you and the person next to you, they'll know too. It's called death. And until that happens, friend, he has a purpose for you in this season of your life, no matter how hard it is or difficult it is. And it may be that in this season of life, what he's asking you to do is just do a reset. Just do a reset. Realizing, as Chima said, God will not fail. Man, that, isn't that a hopeful message? I'm so glad I can tell people, regardless of who you are or from where you've come, God will not, he will not fail. Why? He cannot fail. It is the nature of God to be faithful. He is faithful. He cannot fail you. He will not fail you. Last week, we talked about resetting our Sundays and how important that is to kind of reestablishing the priority of truly of the Lord's day. And saying, by the grace of God, I'm going to use Sunday to be my time of worship, my time of Bible study. If I can attend, I'm going to attend. If not, I'm going to watch online. I'm going to give myself on the Lord's Day some time of focused and uninterrupted attention to consider what God would speak into my life. And so we have a reset of Sunday. And this morning, I want to talk to you about something that I think may be the most significant part of our life. I want to talk to you about resetting our schedule. Resetting our schedule. Um, back in about 1967, a guy named Charles Hummel came out with a book called Tyranny of the Urgent. Tyranny of the Urgent. And in the book, he speaks of how the tension that we have in our life is the tension between things that are urgent and things that are important. And when you stop a moment to think about your life, you probably will agree that that's exactly the life you're living right now. On one hand, you have things that are absolutely urgent, that demand our attention, and sometimes the urgent has to have the priority. That's why we have hospitals that have what they call urgent care. <laughs> there are times when you cannot neglect the urgent, 
But I'm saying that those urgent times are seasonal. They, they, they shouldn't be um, um, systems. And there's a difference between a season and a system, or let me give it to you this way, a season and a cycle. I, I can't help the seasons of life. Seasons come and seasons go. There'll be seasons where I'm dealing with illness and there's seasons where I'm dealing with heartache and there's seasons, I, I can't control the seasons. I can't control cycles. I can't control patterns. I can't control habits. And what you don't want is for a bad season to become an accepted cycle. In other words, you have to recognize this is seasonal, I'll get through this, but I'm not gonna allow this season to define my life, and I'm not gonna allow this season to mark how I spend the rest of my time. This is a season, this is not a cycle. And so if you aren't intentional and you aren't purposeful, then that which is urgent in your life, watch this, will take place of that which is important. And the big challenge, I don't know about you, the big challenge for most of us is that we're not doing bad things but we may be doing a lot of good things instead of the best things. Have you thought about that? I mean, I'm not doing a lot of bad things. It's not that with my way I spend my schedule and my time. All the things that I'm doing are probably good, but are they the best? That's where an honest evaluation has to take place. That's where you have to really look hard at your life and you have to make the assessment so that you can then reset the schedule so that you're certain that in the seasons of life that the urgent doesn't become the norm and you start neglecting gradually the important. Now, I probably could ask you, what do you consider to be important in your life? You'd say, my family, and I, I think you'd be honest about that. I think my family too. Your friends are important, right? Your job, your career, you gotta keep uh, food on the table, that's important. You, uh, uh, people work for you or you work for someone, you have that responsibility, that's important. Uh, you think about all the things you have in your life, think about them uh, 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 like plates that are spinning and, and you get all these plates that are spinning and to keep all the plates spinning, you have to give attention to all of them and, and before you, you know it, your life is so hurried and so scary because you're doing a lot of things that you know are important but if, when you stop on a message like this and you evaluate how you're doing, I would be surprised probably to know how few of us feel that we're doing all of those things well. Probably if we were very honest, we would say, ah, I love my family, but I, I, I wish I could spend more time with them. Or I love my friends, but I feel like a lot of times I, I neglect my friends. I, I, I could spend, I, I just, I, I'm doing good with my job, but man, if I, if I could just do a little better here, I think it could, I, I think probably if we were honest in our evaluation, we probably would all feel like we're coming up short in how we're doing the things that we would admittedly say are very important. And I guess what I wanna do in the time you and I are together this morning is just make us stop long enough to consider, could it, could it be that we have a lot of good things that are crowding out the best things and they're keeping us from doing the most important things? Because right now we're dealing only with the most urgent things. In fact, let me give you a, a, a great truism. Uh, well, let me share the text and then I'll give you that truism. But the text is Ephesians 5. Look at verse 15. Notice the instruction, look carefully. Look carefully, stop, lock, uh, look and listen. Look carefully, give attention. How you walk. Now, that's an expression that means how you live your daily life. There's times when you'll run, but you'll walk more than you run. So what he's implying in the text there, Paul is saying, give attention to how you're living your life. Give attention to how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. And I'll say, when we look at our time, we're either wise or we're otherwise. So he's saying, let's be wise in how we're spending our time making the best use of the time, why the days are evil, and we're living in very stressful days, difficult days. Then he went on to say, therefore. Now remember in the Bible, when you see the word therefore, always look and see what it's there for. It connects what he's about to say with what he's just said. He said, because that's true, therefore, notice he says, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, meaning that you and I are in charge of these decisions that we make that deal with how we spend our time. I'm in charge of that. You're in charge of that. Right now this morning, you and I can make some decisions in this room that if we're willing to follow up with them during this coming week could make a huge difference in our life. Now here's the truism I wanted to give you and I've shared this with you before. Here's a principle. You will live your life according to the priorities that you establish or you'll live your life according to the pressure other people put on you, one or the other. Uh, when I look at pressure, I think about urgent things. 
And again, there are times when you have to respond to pressure. And not all pressure is bad, by the way. If you don't have a little pressure, if you don't have a little stress, you won't get out of bed tomorrow morning. Uh, these instruments on the stage, these guitars, for example, um, there has to be enough stress on the string or they don't make music. If there's too much stress on the string, the music is shrill. If there's not enough stress on the string, the music is dull. And so a great musician knows how much stress to put on the string. So your string needs some stress. <laughs> not all stress on your string is bad. If your life is gonna make music, you gotta have a little tension. You gotta have a little stress. So a little stress on the string is good, but you have to evaluate how much stress is on my string. Am I shrill? Am I getting in people's grill? <laughs> am, I, am I on edge? Am I road raging? Uh, or am I going the other extreme? Am I thinking my problems will go away if I avoid them? Like that French philosopher who said, I've got so much to do today, I'm going back to bed. <laughs> yeah, every day like that. And so your life can become dull because of inactivity or inaction. And so either extreme is not healthy, either extreme is bad, but the urgent is always tied to pressure. Now the priority are things you and I establish for ourselves, our priorities. And if you say, well, Bill, what are, what are biblical priorities? I can give you what I believe to be five that I could support with scripture. Number one, the first priority of a person's life should be their relationship to God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. Not God in relationship to your religion, but God in relationship to your relationship. God if you never go to church. God if you never were a part of a ministry. God if it's just you and God in the mountains or in the ocean alone, it's you and God. Uh, there's nothing about going to a church that's going to cause you to go to heaven anyway. There's nothing about the baptistry that will uh, wash the sins and cause you to go to heaven anyway. Salvation is not in the Lord's table or in baptism. The, the Bible says in uh, Acts chapter 4, 12, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved in the name Jesus. So it's a relationship with Jesus that makes a difference. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So salvation is in a personal faith in Jesus Christ apart from religion. So that's my first priority is my relationship to Christ. Your second priority would be your relationship to your spouse. In the garden, God established this. He said, therefore, a man will leave his father and mother, cling to his wife, they too shall be one flesh. So he established the priority of that relationship. Then the third priority would be the relationship you have to your children. He blessed Adam and Eve with kids, and kids are a blessing. There goes a little blessing right there. And uh, kids are a great blessing. We love our children. Uh, I'm grateful for the kids and grandkids now that I have, and what would we do without those little boogers? And so we love those babies. And those kids are a, certainly a great priority in your life, in my life. First, fourth priority, I would say, would be your career, your job. The Bible to says that God told Adam, take care of the garden, take care of this place. Somebody said one time, well, wouldn't it be great we wouldn't have to work if sin hadn't entered the picture? But if you look at the order of things, work was established before sin entered the picture meaning that God created Adam to work. If you don't work, you don't feel good about yourself. You need to be doing something, right? And so he said, take care of this place. Now, sin made work more difficult, right? But it, uh, it, it, it was established before sin enters the picture. So that became the fourth priority. The fifth priority is your worship, your worship. God established a form of worship through a sacrificial system that involved giving, it involved serving, and so you have worship. So those are five. Now you could add friendships behind that, you could add whatever behind it, but I'm saying I can give you five. And oftentimes, if you don't live your life according to those priorities, you're going to inevitably be living your life according to others' pressure. So here's the first thing I would challenge you to do this morning. Number one, evaluate, evaluate. Hit the pause button just for a few moments and evaluate how are you spending your time. Listen to Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days. Hear the wording of that? He didn't say number our years. He said to number our days. Why is that important? Because as your days are, so will your years be. Teach us to number our days. Our, our days are, how am I spending my time today? Uh, your five-year plan is good, I've always admired people that can do those five-year plans. I tried to do that. I bought the planning things. I've, done the, I've read the books. 
I tried that. I, it, it's like, you know, I, I bought the books on mind mapping a few years ago to try to figure out what makes me tick, and that's frightening to try to dig into your own mind. And I'm looking at that, because I was trying to improve my, my speaking on the weekends, you know, and I'm kind of looking at all that kind of stuff. I got a pastor friend of mine here this morning, and he knows what that's like. You're always trying to improve your stuff and get better at what you're doing. And I have these guys that are so good, they memorize everything. They can go off of a, a, a well-developed script. You know, they can just go off of that. I tried that, and it came off like I was just reading the news, you know. And, and my grandmother told me one time something about, she said, well, honey, uh, first of all, she said, you, you know, uh, you're not a good reader. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, it wasn't really worth reading, uh, so she tried to evaluate my speaking, so I knew that wasn't gonna work for me. So as I told you last week, I had to find my own style, and my own style is more extemporaneous, where I prepare myself, I get to where I know my material, and then I kinda come out in front of you, and you kinda help me by how you're responding, and if I try to finish before you do, and if I feel like I'm connecting, I may stay on something a little longer. If I feel like I've lost you, I may go fishing to try to find you again. So it's extemporaneous, so we're all in this crazy eclectic experience for about 25 minutes together, so I'm sorry that I take you on this neurotic trip with me, but I'm glad you go. But the point is, I tried to figure myself out, and it just didn't work for me. All of that type of map doesn't. So I had to find how I work. I had to find what, what, what is my fit, and I had to begin to get into that sort of rhythm of what works. So I, 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 I love guys that can do those five-year plans. I couldn't do it. But here's what I found, and man, this helped me a lot. Hope it'll help you if you struggle with that a little bit too. If I can take care of my five-minute plan, my five-year plan will take care of itself, right? If I can watch what I do over the next five minutes of my life, the next five years tends to take care of itself. Just make good choices in the now. Make good choices now. Number your days. Make good decisions today. As your days are, so will your strength be, the scriptures say. So just make a good call today. Work on the five-minute plan. Make sure you're making a good call. Evaluate how you're spending your time in the five minutes. Number those days, and it's a great way to evaluate. You, you have to evaluate the time that you appropriate. Does that make sense? So I evaluate the time that I appropriate to make certain that the priority of the important is overcoming the urgency of the now. Uh, another thing to consider, and I touched this last week, but in Hebrews chapter two, the writer of Hebrews warns them, he says, look, you have to pay attention or things that are important will drift, will drift. He indicates a slow movement away from where you should be. They drift. It's a nautical term. It's the idea of when you're bringing a ship to shore, you give great attention to the channel, you're careful not to drop the sail too soon, to when to pull the oars in, to when to cut power to the motor, because if you do it too soon, you'll drift, you'll miss the dock, you'll miss the place to where you need to take the boat out. So you have to give great attention or you'll drift. And so that was the warning of Hebrews 2, and I think it's a great warning for us because the, 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 really the, the sinister, uh, sinister ploy of the evil one is not to fill our hearts with hatred of God, but with forgetfulness of God, forgetfulness of God. And we drift. Uh, it, it, we, we, he doesn't fill our hearts with hatred of our family, but with forgetfulness of our family. He doesn't fill our hearts with uh, hatred of our career, but with just forgetfulness and neglect of the career. And so it's, it, it's a drift. And you really don't know you've drifted until you do what I'm talking about this morning. You stop and evaluate where you are. And you begin to say, well, how in the world am I spending the time? And am I living truly according to priority? Or have I started responding merely to pressure? Can I say one more thing before I move off of evaluate? I really don't think it's time management as much as it is self-discipline. I think it's self-management. You know why, Here, here's why I say that. We all get, are given the same amount of time. You're not given any more time than I or I than you. you. We get 168 hours a week. So it's not the time, it's not that, well, some people just, boy, if I had all the time you had, all the time, oh, no, no, no. You've got all, you got, we have the same amount of time. It's how are we spending the time that we're given, right? So it's not really, think about it, it's not really time management as much as it may be self-discipline. How am I spending the time that God has given me? And it's important that I consider how I'm spending my time. For example, am I killing myself to climb a ladder that might be leaning against the wrong wall? 
I mean, you may be just burning the candle at both ends and you're killing yourself climbing this ladder and you're gonna get up there and realize you spent all that time climbing a ladder that's leaning against the wrong wall. You've given yourself to someone or something that does not value you, do not appreciate you, and you've made them the priority or that the priority, and you realize after you've done all of that, what a waste that has been. Evaluate. You may be halfway up the ladder. That's okay. Just stop. You, you can begin. You know the great thing about God? He's the God of the second chance. You can begin again. There's plan B. I think I said that, didn't I? I said it in one of the services. <laughs> There's a plan B. I mean, in NASA, when they fire those rockets off, one of the things about it is those rockets are designed with computer systems on board that will correct the trajectory of the rocket. It'll correct everything necessary to so that the rocket will reach its objective. There's no flight plan they file that works perfectly because they cannot, um, they cannot know all of the forces that that rocket may encounter once it leaves the pad. So those rockets are given great instruction through the computer systems on board to adjust and to move and to change according to where they're going. And the only time the rocket is destroyed is if it turns around and it heads back to the Cape. Well, I'm telling you, if rockets are that valuable to NASA, how much more valuable are you and I to God? Fearfully, wonderfully made. We're the Imago Dei. We're made in the image of God. Though a marred image, we're made in his likeness. He sent his son to save us. So man, don't give up on you because God's never given up on you and there is a plan B. You just need to slow down long enough to say, I've climbed this ladder too long. I'm climbing back down. I'm gonna reduce, I'm gonna reset some things. I'm going to evaluate. You got it? Number two, not only evaluate, here's the second word, eliminate. Eliminate. You gotta make some decisions. Back in our text, Ephesians 5, 16, make the best use of your time. You have to look at how I'm structuring my schedule. I've got to eliminate some things. Look, identifying the problem, you're halfway there. That's wonderful. I mean, we get in these big old holy huddles and we huddle up and we kind of get a plan. And then we break the huddle, everybody kind of leaves with an assignment. And we know kind of what we're supposed to do. Okay, here's what I'm supposed to do. This is the play. I feel like I'm clear on that. But, but the breakdown comes in what we know to do and when we actually do it. The, the good that we know to do and the doing of the good that we know to do. And James even speaks to that. In fact, James said, if you know to do good and you don't do the good that you know to do, it becomes sin. It actually works against you. So knowledge is important and it's essential to make changes in your life, but as, as important as knowing what to do is actually doing the thing. Because a lot of times we break out of the huddle and there's no change, our relationships don't change, our business doesn't change, our life doesn't change. It's not that we needed new revelation, we just weren't obedient to the revelation that we already had. <laughs> we just needed to do what we know to do. Most people don't need to know anything new, you just need to know how to do what you know how to do. You, uh, let me rephrase that, you need to do what you know how to do. You know, when you attracted that girl, you know how to win her heart, you handsome devil you. You romantic guy, you. You know how to win that girl over. You got her into the second date, that's something, huh? And all of a sudden, man, you're winning that girl. She said, oh, he's so, he is so romantic. He's such a wonderful guy. And she finally marries you or commits to you and she's like, was I marrying his agent? Or what happened to this guy that I married, right? And it's not that guys need to know how to do it. We know how to, we know how to do that. It's just that we drift and we neglect and sometimes we have to evaluate and we have to eliminate and we have to go back and say, we, need, we can fix this. It's within our power to fix it. If it's important, you will. And so you have to eliminate some things and you have to say, I'm gonna make some decisions. Ephesians 5, 15, careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. That has to do with eliminating some things. And if you aren't careful, if you aren't careful, you'll start neglecting some of the most important people in your life to do the things that you do. For example, you say, okay, my goals are, let's get back to priorities. My goal is to be, you know, uh, have a strong faith in God and my goal is to be a good spouse and my goal is to be a good uh, parent or grandparent. My goal is to be a good uh, a worker. My goal is to uh, have church on my grid. Uh, I wanna be a good friend, maybe number six. And, and I, I will contend to be good in all those areas, you, you may have to neglect some other area at certain times to be good in all those areas. Now, I'm not, I hope I'm not contradicting myself. Let me explain what I mean by that. 
you're going to go through seasons that will cause you sometimes to get a little bit out of balance. I talked to you last week about starting a business. When Cindy and I started the church, it's not unlike starting a business, you're just all in. But we were all in together. That was the difference. We knew it was gonna be hard. We knew there was gonna be some sacrifices. We knew we were gonna to have to give up some things in the short run so we could get where we wanted to go in the long run. The Bible even says in Proverbs, first build your uh, barn, then build your house. It's the idea that you gotta build your business so that you got a house that you can build. So there's this idea that for a while, in a season of time, you, you, you know, you may get out of balance. But if you're together on the decision, it makes the decision so much more healthier, healthier. And it's a season, remember, it's not a cycle. And so you say, look, for this season, we're in this together, we're gonna to partner together, this is gonna be a hard season for us, we're gonna get through this, but we're gonna get through it together. And I, and I can tell you from my personal experience, had at any point in time, had Cindy bailed and just simply said, this is too hard, Bill, I can't do it, I had other options and, and somebody else would have done this and I would have been doing something else because I valued her in my life. We were together 42 years before she went to heaven and somebody said, how do you stay married that long? I said, I always told Cindy, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. <laughs> and so I'm just suggesting to you that we made these decisions together. And I'm saying if you're a young business owner or you're in a season of life right now where you get out of balance a little bit with family and while you're trying to get that going, it's a season. It's not, don't let it be a cycle. Don't let that become a cycle. Right now it's a season, you're, you're, but, but be together on the, on the decision so you don't resent each other. And when the problems pop up, attack the problem, don't attack each other. Because one or another ploy of the devil is to get you after each other and not after the problem. And if you can stay focused on the problem and not the person, you can work through just about anything. And they're gonna be, see, my, my point is, and please don't miss what I'm saying, my point is there's gonna be seasons when things will get a little out of balance. You may be a little over here because you're too much over there and you're trying to find balance, but it, 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 it's a season that you're going through and you'll get through it. Just don't let it become a cycle. It's just a season. It's a necessary season because you can't be good at everything without neglecting something. If you play golf, I used to try to play golf and it frustrated me so much because I was terrible and I didn't see myself getting any better. And I had a friend of mine tell me one time, he said, you know, Bill, I don't want to chase anything that far that I can't eat. <laughs> I thought, that's kind of funny. I hunt, so I get that. Um, I just couldn't do it because I got more frustrated. And I have friends that do that, and God bless them, and all that kind of thing. But, but my, here's my point with that crazy, is that to do that very well, you got to do that a lot. And, and I wasn't getting any, I was horrible. I mean, horrible. I, I don't want to get there, go there. But the point I'm making is, I, it, to be good as a spouse, to be good as a parent, to be good as a business person, to be good as a friend, to be a good church member, to be, you, you're gonna have to give somewhere because you don't have, you're a limited resource with limited resources. So man, it, you gotta manage this thing. It, it's, it, it's an inexact science. And some things you're gonna have to do when you get out of balance, I gotta eliminate a little over here to fix this a little bit over there. And, and, and can I give you one other caution on that? Be careful who you're getting all, who, who, you're, who you're asking to wait all the time on you so that you can do the, these other things. Make sure your family isn't getting the most weights. Uh, you may be telling them yes, but your lifestyle is telling them no. And here's what happens with weights. Wait, and we'll do this together. Wait, we'll take a trip. Wait, we'll do a date night. Wait, we'll spend more time together. Wait, and we'll, yeah, wait, 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 wait. Here's what happens. Weights, W-A-I-T-S, become weights, W-E-I-G-H-T-S, after a while. And it isn't long until the weights become weights. And initially, the people you're asking to wait is carrying the most weight. <laughs> and they're only gonna be able to do that for so long. And, and, and you, may not, you may not realize it. It's subtle, remember, it's a drift. You say, wait, wait, we'll do this. Wait, 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 we'll do this. Wait, 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 we'll do this. It's like looking at someone, if I was standing up here and I'm holding weights and I've got them on my back and my shoulders and I got all these weights on me and you look at me and go, man, it looks like he's carrying a lot up there. Wow, it's a lot of weight. And you say, hey man, can you carry? Yeah, yeah, throw it on my back. I think I can get it. And all of a sudden, man, my knees are shaking and I'm, you know, I'm freaking out a little bit. You go, oh, you're still hanging. Hang in there, buddy. Woo, hang in there. You can do it. And you know, you're all up here shaking. And all of a sudden, man, I, I drop them. I just fall apart. I can't carry the weights anymore. Now, here's the reality of it. 
Nobody, nobody really sees or appreciates how much weight you're carrying, but when you drop the weights, everybody sees it. The kids hear it. <laughs> uh, the neighbors may hear it. <laughs> wow, that was loud. Because a lot of weight just fell off of you because you've been carrying something and all of a sudden, your physical weariness could not handle your emotional weariness. And all of a sudden, the weights that you've been carrying was, were too many weights and you couldn't bear it anymore. I'm just trying to help you this morning. I've talked to too many people who sat in my office and just said, man, all of a sudden, she's just not happy and she's gone. And I'm thinking, well, she's probably been telling you a long time she's out the door, you just didn't hear. This, it, it probably didn't happen overnight. She's, she's, she's been gone a long time. Or they say, man, the kids' grades just dropped overnight. They were doing so good, and all of a sudden, they just, they just tank. No, 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 that didn't happen overnight. I was fourth in my class. I was a D student. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't a great student. Especially I wasn't great at math, but four out of three people aren't good at math either, so I always felt good about that. <laughs> but the point is, I, I, I knew that for my grades to improve would be a great trend. You know, remember that story of the teacher where the guy's arguing with her and said, I don't think I deserved an F. The teacher said, I don't think you deserve an F either, but it's the lowest grade I could give you. I hit so close to home right now. But anyway, the point I make, I got through, thank the Lordy. Not, not summa cum laude or, or you know, sigma cum, but thank the laude. So I got out of school. <laughs> but I'm just saying that that doesn't happen overnight. My point is, I don't miss it. The point is, it's a, it's a drift. It's a drift. So all I'm trying to get you to do on a Sunday morning, I'm not trying to add to your burden. I'm trying to help you. I don't want to talk to you when you're going through that. I don't want you to have to call me and come and sit down and me and me look across at you and us have to walk through that. I, my heart is heavy for you. And if I can keep you from that experience, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say, it, it, what you're doing is not working. You've got to reset. And you can, you can. You can reset this thing. And could it be, could it be this morning that God brought you here to this room just to give you an opportunity to say, by the grace of God, I am now officially sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I'm gonna make some changes that are good, number one, for me, that are gonna be good for my family. I'm gonna reset my schedule. And can I tell you, sometimes changes don't happen in your life till you get downright snow white, brazen bright, bright mad. And you just get so mad at your situation that you change it. And you gotta eliminate some stuff out of your life that's not working. You, you may have to tell some people, no, no. <laughs> you're gonna have to take that little silly problem down the hall. No, I'll get to that when I can. You ain't even, you, you're not, on, not only on my priority, you ain't even on the list. You're way down here. And I'm just telling you, you have to learn to tell people, you have to learn how to tell these people, no. Because you'll find yourself, and I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I love people and we all love people, but I'm just saying, the point is, if you don't, you're gonna find yourself giving most of your time to people who love you the least and respect you the least. So you have to make some changes. Eliminate. Here's one more and we'll go home. Last one is elevate. Elevate, raise your game. First Peter 4, 2, as a result, this one does not live the rest of their life to selfish desires, but for the will of God. Let me give a summarize of that principle. I can't do anything about my past. I can't do anything. I can be sad for it. I can have the regrets about it. But, but beyond that, you, you can't do anything about it. So why, why live in it? You can't live in it, uh, you, you know. And good or bad, happy or sad, once you, God's forgiven you, forgive yourself and move on, move, move forward. Get past your past and start making changes today that are good for you. What is, what is the best change? What is the healthiest change you could make for yourself right now? Begin moving in that direction. Elevate your game. Because though you can't do anything about where it's been, but listen, you can do everything about where it's going. You can do everything about where it's going. You can have a good life. You can have a joyful life. You can have a life again that makes you excited about waking up and facing the day instead of waking up going, good Lord, it's morning. You can wake up and say, good morning, Lord. <laughs> I'm ready to face my day again. But it's gonna require some changes and it's gonna require a reset and it's gonna require elevating. Let me give you some things to think about as I close. I would tell you, number one, begin to plan your day. Get ahead of your schedule, plan your day. I would tell you to prioritize, prioritize your task. 
Live according to priority. What, is, what are the important things tomorrow for you? Plan your day. What, what are the priorities that I want to get done tomorrow? Number three, say no to non-essentials. Non-essentials, you say no, I'm sorry. That I'll get to it if I can, but that's not really an essential. Uh, I, I would tell you uh, another thing to do is learn how to delegate. Remember, there's a difference between delegating and dumping. If somebody works for you and you delegate, what you want to say to them is, this is an important task. I would do it. I just don't have time. Could you please do this for me? Nobody resents that. But if what they're hearing you say is, this is beneath me or something I wouldn't do, but because you work for me, you're going to do the job I won't do, that's dumping and everybody resents that. <laughs> but they don't remind being, de you can delegate. You say, look, I do this. I, I'm not too good to do it, but man, you take a huge load off me if you could help me with this. I'm saying, if it's a burden, it should be shared. If it's a blessing, it should be shared, right? So learn how to delegate. Here's another thing I would tell you to consider. Uh, think about your biological time clock. Let me explain that. When do you work best? Are you morning guy or night girl? When, when, when are you the most creative? Understand that some of you are morning people. You just like, I mean, cock-a-doodle-doo. You're up and you are on your way. You are morning people. Love it. I'm more a morning guy. Not crazy morning like Jim, but, but kind of later morning, not that 4.30 business, you know. I may get up, but I'm not thinking about anything when that time of the morning. But, the, but I'm not that, right? I'm, but I'm a morning guy. I do, I, they'll tell you, all the people that have worked with me for a long time, about two or three o'clock, I'm still around, but boy, I am zoned out. I can, you, I, I'll agree to almost anything about two or three in the afternoon. I'll be sitting in a meeting and they'll, just, they'll laugh and they'll go, he's not even listening. And you know what? They're right. <laughs> I'm not listening at all. I'm, tu I'm tuned out. I'm somewhere else. They should have got me about eight 7.30, 8 o'clock this morning, I'm firing on all cylinders, man. I'm hell, I'm thinking right now, we're, sol we're problem solving. We can do that. And all, of a, and all of a sudden, now I'm on autopilot, and I'm hoping I don't run out of fuel, and I am just cruising. I'm just getting, so I, so I know that about me. Do you know that about you? Do you know when you do your best work? And now some of you are really weird ducks. You do your best work at night. Usually it's more artistic people. It's just strange how they work. You're all a strange group of people. You kick in late in the afternoon and you are, man, you are popping on all cylinders. 10, 11 o'clock at night, you are creative. You're coming up with ideas. And I'm sitting there going, my brain is in like full shutdown mode. I'm just like, oh gosh, you're like, melting, I'm done. And they're just like, man, that's when, okay, that's, I'm just saying that's fine. Be who you are, but understand who you are so you know when to expect your most of, uh, you know, uh, pr productive time throughout your day. We're talking about planning, right? Here's another thing I would give you quickly. I would say start doing the thing in the morning you dread the most. Get that out of the way. I mean, start your day with the thing you hate to, the most. You gotta do it, but you dread it. All right, let's say if you got a bad phone call, you gotta have a confrontation with somebody, do that first thing. You know what'll happen if you don't? You put it off because you dread doing it and you'll, you'll, you'll mess your whole day up. You'll dread the whole day. So what I do, if I, have a, if I have a hard conversation or if I have a, a meeting with somebody and we gotta have a hard conversation, I try to get my day started. So I, nobody wants to have breakfast with me for whatever reason. But anyway, the point is, you try to get that over, you try to get that, that meeting done early because you get it out of the way. And then it doesn't just shoot your whole, you may ruin their day, but it doesn't ruin your day. <laughs> and so, so get that out of the way. And then the last thing I would say, and this is really important, kind of back to where I started, take care of yourself, pace yourself. I, I can't, look, I can't see the weight you're carrying. Unless you tell me, I won't know. Unless I tell you, you won't know. You know why? I've been in church all my life. I'm a good hypocrite. I can nail it. I can nail it. I can walk in this room and you'd never know how, if I'm discouraged or not. I can smile when I don't want to smile. I can carry on when I don't want to carry on. I can tell you I love this when I may be hating it. I, I'm, I'm a, I've learned how to do that. And, and, and we all know how to do that, really. So, yeah, I don't go to church, too many hypocrites. I always, oh, come on, one more, and you won't hurt anything. <laughs> We're all hypocritical. And that's okay. That's all right. I mean, when you want to ask somebody how they're doing, listen, that's just a greeting. Nobody wants you to pull the x-rays. <laughs> you really want to know how I'm doing? <laughs> got a minute? Not really. <laughs> I'm just a greeting. <laughs> I was feeling pretty good until I met you. <laughs> you know, I think I'm okay now. Um, I'm done now, I'm just, I'm, we're off-roading here a little bit, but the point is, <laughs> the point I'm making is just simply that you gotta watch the gauges. You, you got gauges, you got an emotional gauge, you got a spiritual gauge, you got a physical gauge, watch your gauges, watch your gauges. 
take some time. If you need some time, take some time. Jesus sat down by the well, the Bible says, because he was tired, tired. If Jesus, the perfect son of God, had to take a sabbatical, who are we to think we don't need one? I've had people say, well, Bill, I'd rather burn out as rust out, one the you know, macho kind of a thing, and I said, well, either way you go, you're out, sport. Out's out, you can burn out or you can rust out, but out's out. What am I getting at, balance? Watch the gauges. Take some time for yourself, pace yourself. You may need to talk to somebody. You may need to press into a friend. You may need to get away. You may need to go to solitude, isolation. Go to the mountains, get out on the ocean, go to a lake somewhere. Just get away from everybody and everything. Wrap your head around uh, wh where you are and what you need to do and, and get a new game plan, right? Pace yourself, monitor yourself. Make sure that you're doing the right things and you're doing what God would have you to do. Reset your schedule. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word that oftentimes we read it and it's just profound. It's, it's just so profound. It's even hard for us sometimes to comprehend all that your word is implying. And then sometimes your word is just so practical. It's just got, has principles that just are so simple that the smallest child could understand what it's communicating. And I, I, I pray this morning we've dealt with some very practical things. Hopefully that'll help my brothers and sisters here this morning and those watching online reassess and evaluate and reset some things in their life. And Lord, I, I realize there's some people here this morning that are carrying some very heavy, heavy loads. Some of them are dealing with things they haven't told their closest friends about. Right now, their thoughts and their heart, you alone see it and know it. And I, I guess, Lord, all I'm wanting to do is for you to assure them that you've got them, that you've got this, that you will not fail them. If they fall anywhere, let them fall at your feet. We can fall on the rock, but we can't fall off of it. So, Father, I pray that you'll have people who are carrying the heaviest burdens in this room this morning Give that burden to you. I pray the time we've been here at this hour and 10 minutes will have been valuable enough that when we leave, we'll see how resetting a Sunday he really helped us today. Thank you for the worship and thank you for your word. And finally, Lord, I pray for my friends who may never, ever have trusted you as their savior, that this might be the moment right where they are, where they humble their heart, they swallow their pride, and they say, Lord Jesus, with all that I know about me, I now trust all that I know about you. Come into my heart, forgive my sin. I invite you into my life, and I ask this in Christ's name, amen.